All right, guys, we're going to go ahead and get started this morning here. Um, one thing to note, we're probably going to wrap up a little early as both of our speakers have to jump off a couple minutes early to make it to other commitments this morning. But welcome to virtual breakfast. My name is Jenna Failer, and I am the field crops educator up in the Upper Thumb region. With that being said, our speaker this morning morning is MSU wheat specialist Dennis Pennington and he's going to be talking about setting the stage for record-breaking wheat yields. Yeah so good morning my name is Dennis Pennington wheat extension specialist with Michigan State University and uh, I'll talk to you a little bit about uh, planting wheat uh, here this morning and hopefully answer some questions. There's a bunch of research that we've been working on uh, Dr. Manny Singh and I in particular uh, with looking at some different planting methods and whatnot. We don't have time to cover all of that material, but we're happy to answer some questions. And if Manny's on here this morning, uh, we can maybe tag team on some of that stuff. But so what I want to do is kind of cover more of like just the, what, what are the most important things when, uh, when you're getting ready to plant wheat? So first thing is variety selection. Uh, make sure you search for all the information you can find um, related to variety performance and how they do on your soils, your climate, um, and in your area. Uh, we at, at Michigan State University publish and, and perform the uh, state wheat performance trials. Uh, we plant at uh, eight different counties scattered across the state, so we're not covering in everybody's neighborhood, but we try to get kind of the major wheat production areas um, covered there. Uh, Last year, we had 114 entries from 15 different companies. Um, this data is published uh, at the Variety Trials website. If you go, if you search Variety Trials, uh, MSU, and, and uh, then click on Wheat, and you'll be able to download a copy of this report. Um, so you'll be able to see the, the yield data, uh, as well as moisture, test weight, height, color, uh, fusarium head blight ratings, flowering date, and so on. Uh, for all of these varieties that are included um, in this uh, in this report. Um, it's also on the Michigan Wheat website um, at miwheat.org on the main page. Uh, if you, you click on the main page, there's a link directly to it. And then those of you that received the Michigan Farm News uh, publication from Michigan Farm Bureau, um, it was printed in the August 15th uh, edition in full. Uh, so it's available in, in multiple different locations. So I would suggest you seek out the, this information and, and look to see how the varieties uh, performed. There's never any one variety that always yields the highest in all the locations. Um, it's variable across the state because we have varying um, soil and climate conditions um, at each of the locations. So you want to select varieties that perform well in your area. Um, when making decisions on what variety to select, you want to look at multi-year data, uh, make sure that they have adaption over different weather uh, scenarios. You want to look at um, varieties that perform well across different locations in a range of soil types and climates near your area. So pick the two or three locations that would be closest or most similar to you and look at how what varieties perform the best in, in those areas. The most important thing to look at when you're selecting varieties is yield. Um, you know, yield is ultimately the, the number one item, um, you know, trying to get the highest yield uh, possible is, is the, the goal behind picking a, a variety. Secondary there and not too far behind it is disease resistance, um, specifically fusarium head blight um, primarily because that's the, the number one disease and the most economic loss uh, disease problem in wheat across the U.S. So, um, and if you have, we haven't had a bad fusarium head blight year um, in a couple of years now, uh, but in, in a year that you have it, you want to have, you can fight with fungicides, but you still have to have resistance coupled with fungicide management um, to deal with fusarium head blight because there's nothing that is completely resistant. I would say they're less susceptible or somewhat resistant um, to it. They're not completely resistant. Um, then there's in, in our report, we have uh, both red and white wheats as well. So depending on where you are, um, you know, look, look for those. Uh, maturity, I suggest planting a, a range of maturities on your farm. Uh, there's not a huge difference uh, like there are in corn. In corn, you can get a lot bigger uh, variation in, in maturity than what you can in wheat. Generally, wheat will flower within about a seven to 10 day window. Um, so, but when you're selecting varieties, try to pick some that are on the early end and some in the mid, some on the late, 
um, when you're when you're selecting for your farm. Um, we also publish our conventional management versus high management. Um, we're testing these varieties to see how well they respond to uh, trying to ramp up some nitrogen, add fungicide. There are some varieties that respond very well and, and have significant yield improvement when you do that. Um, there's other varieties that you can start throwing more, more inputs at it, and it just seems to perform about the same level. So um, if, if you're, you know, look at that information in table five, and uh, based on the way you want to manage it, if you don't want to have to get out there and make those extra applications, or maybe you don't have time because you're you're busy doing other, uh, you know, crop work at that time, you want to pick a variety that that does well in the conventional management um, to to plant on your farm. Where to get the seed from? Um, I always suggest uh, planting certified seed. It's always the best quality. Um, and because it's been run across the gravity table, it's been properly cleaned, it's been treated, um, and it, it eliminates some of those uh, poor seed, um, you know, that, that are in the, for example, in, in the, this picture here, you can see down here some seed that's even sprouted and some uh, kind of shriveled seed and, and whatnot. You want good, bright colored seed to plant, um, and you want the, the big and the plump seed um, as, as best as possible, which means higher thousand kernel weight um, on that seed. If you are going to use bin run seed, make sure you clean it and treat it. Um, uh, we did we had a little bit of sprout this last year, not as bad as a couple of years ago. Um, but if you did have some sprout and you're saving seed, um, you only use the, the seed lot if there's less than 5% of it is sprouted. And I'd suggest you do a germ test and you can contact Michigan Foundation Seed and, and you know, bring a, a sample of seed to them to do the germ test. Or you can just pick out 100 seeds, lay it on a piece of paper towel, um, keep it damp, put it in the refrigerator um, and then let it go for three or four days and then count how many seeds germinated um, and then adjust your seeding rate based on that percentage of germination. So, um if you have the ability to run across um, a screen or gravity table, uh, do it. Um, and as I mentioned before, the bigger the seed, the higher the thousand kernel weight. Um, the, those seed, the, these bigger seeds are better able, there's more um, energy in them to germinate and get emerged compared to seed lot that would look like this over here on the right. Um, and then make sure it's free of disease. I've gotten a few calls for some growers that have uh, common bunt or stinking smut. Um, and make sure you're you're not replanting or re-inoculating basically those diseases when you're you're planting your seed, and that would be true if you're using the seed for uh, cover crop purposes as well. So th this is a picture that uh, Martin Nagelkirk. He's now retired. Uh, I kind of miss him. Uh, he's he's been a great uh, resource for us here in the weed industry. But um, a, a picture was showing some uh, loose smut and and some uh, bunt and seeded or bunt seed here uh, compared to good seed um, in the picture here. So when do you plant? You want to plant early. Um, and there's a reason for it because there's a yield response. Um, I'll show you a couple different um, slide or, or data slides here on planting date. Um, this first one comes from Peter Johnson. This is some uh, data that they published from the Huron Research Station. They had planting date of October 5th, 21st, November 15th, and then all the way into January 24th. Um, this was their yield. And you can see that the later in the season you go, what happens to your yield potential? It goes down. So. Um, your goal in the fall is to get two to three tillers. Um, so if this is your main stem here, uh, you've got your first tiller um, over here, second tiller right here, and then your third tiller, this leaf that's emerging right now, um, will be the third tiller once it's fully emerged. This would be your ideal um, size of your plant going into the fall, going into the winter um, in dormancy. So you've got to get planted early enough when there's enough heat left in the soil as well as heat unit accumulation um, that you can get your plants um, growing um, to that level. It takes about 130 uh, growing degree days. Um, heat units on, and this is based on the Celsius scale with a base zero. So it's not the, um, the corn heat units, but uh, for, for wheat heat units, it takes about 130 um, for emergence. So, um, and using data, uh, average daily temperature from the East Lansing uh, weather station at the MSU Hort Farm, um, 
it would take about, on an average year, about 12 days um, for emergence to occur if you plant on October 5th. Um, on October 21st, it takes 16 days. Um, and if you plan on November 15th, 20 days later, we've only accumulated 43 heat units. So it's not even going to merge um, if you plant November 15th. And then, you know, the January plant, it isn't going to emerge until the spring. Okay, so the later you plant, the less growth and development you'll have in the fall. These fall tillers are your highest yielding tillers um, uh, in, in the next summer. So you want to get as much of that produced and created in the fall as possible. So we did a, um, a planting study, uh, Manny and I did for, or we have for three or four years, I think. And this is just, I went out and dug some plants. Um, this picture was taken on December 13th. Um, and so we started planting in mid-September, end of September, mid-October, end of October, and uh, mid-November. So we're trying to target planting date every two weeks, starting the 15th of September. And you can see what the differences are in the growth and development in the fall. So in these first two uh, planting dates, by the end of September, you can see that we've got um, good growth. We've got uh, two to three tillers here. But look what happens when we get to the mid-October. Just going from the 1st of October to mid-October, how many tillers do you see here? You don't see any, do you? Okay, so you got you get just got your, your first three leaves out. Um, you get to the end of October, and this would be the soil line right where the cursor is at. So it was just emerged. And then when you're planting in um, November, and remember this picture is taken on December 13th, it has germinated, and you can see the coleoptile starting to grow. Here, but it hasn't emerged um, and it's going to take a while for it to emerge. So if you're trying to produce high yield wheat, you want to be getting plants that look like this in the fall um, on the left here. So that means you got to plant earlier. So some of the data that we found, um, these are three years worth of uh, planting date data. So it goes from mid-September um, all the way through uh, mid-November uh, here. And this on the, the scale on this axis is the percent of the maximum yield. So in terms of where did we achieve the maximum yield, you can see that we achieved the maximum yield at the early planting dates. And then the later we go, these uh, yields decline. Now there's, for some reason, we had it kind of level off here in 2019 and in 2020. Um, I'm not exactly sure why it leveled off like that. Um, but you can see the later in the season you go, um, the lower the yield potential. So if you can get planted um, by the uh, 1st of October, there's generally less than about a 10% yield loss. Once you go between the uh, 1st of October and mid-October, there's up to a 20% yield loss. Because if you look at where this line falls on, on this mark, it, uh, it, it's somewhere around that 80, 82%. And then the later you get after mid-October, it really starts to decrease and you can have greater than a 20% yield loss. And, and just simply by planting late, you've automatically lowered that yield potential uh, of the crop. So um, part of this study was um, looking at um, planting dates, but we also looked at each of those um, planting dates, we looked at uh, different seeding rates. And so the question was, as we get later planting in the season, how much do we have to increase our seeding rate um, in order to, you know, maintain good yield potential. So here on this axis, again, is our relative yield. So it goes from, uh, well, I guess from 75% up to 100%. Um, and then each of these lines represent the different planting dates. So let's start with a blue line. That's our earliest planting date. Notice that, uh, and then this is seeding rate across the bottom here. So we went from um, 0 0.8 up to 2.4 million seeds per acre. So a wide range in seeding rates. Um, and you can see that even this 0 0.8 uh, million seeding rate really produced about 97% of the yield potential. Um, we were a bit surprised by that. Um, these, these lower seeding rates can still produce good yield potential. But um, you, if you look at how this, this blue line fares across here, it comes up and kind of levels off pretty quickly after 1.2. You're really not getting any benefit to these higher seeding rates um, uh, at all. Uh, at the, and that's the early planting date. So look at the orange dashed line here. And now you're starting a little bit lower. It does pick back up. But now you got your seeding rates got to get a little bit higher. 
Um, in fact, you got to get up to this um, dash line right here. Um, so the agronomically optimum seeding rate um, for this mid-September would be 0 0.93. That's where this dash line is. So at, at 0.93 um, uh, million seeds per acre or 930,000, that's your optimum uh, seeding rate for that date. And then you can see that as you get later in the season, this number ramps up a little bit. And when you get to mid-November, um, the red line here, um, you got to plant uh, about 1.85 million seeds per acre um, in, in order to, you know, maintain the highest percentage of your yield potential. Um, when you plant earlier, um, that allows uh, for more fall tiller production, uh, which results in more heads per plant, um, and it also results in more heads per acre, um, uh, which ultimately leads to higher yield potential um, down the road. Another thing to consider, um, Hessian fly really isn't much of a problem anymore. Um, you can find Hessian fly out flying once in a while, um, but the fly-free date is a good agronomic date to probably start planting um, wheat in your area. And this table is published in the uh, uh, planting wheat uh, uh, article at the MSU uh, Extension News. Uh, we have this planting wheat um, article that we do every year. So uh, this table will be available there. And later on, we can put a link to that in the chat box um, for this. So um, fly-free date uh, is, you know, a good place to target as far as starting. Um, we are in Ingham County here. That date is uh, the 17th of September. So how much seed to plant? Well, um, it depends on your seeds per pound. And you can see um, this this table shows a range from 9,000 seeds per pound up to 16,000 seeds per pound. Um, your bigger seed um, that has the higher thousand kernel weight, the more plump, larger kernels, um, there'll be less seeds uh, per pound. Um, and so you got to you you got to factor that in. You can't just assume that all seed is the same, and that if you're going to plant 1.6 million seeds per acre. Um, you, you have to factor it in for every variety you plant. You, you've got to know what your seeds per pound are to determine what your seeding rate should be. Because um, at 1.6 million seeds per acre, the range in pounds of seed ranges from 178 all the way down to uh, 100, um, just based on um, the, the seeds per pound. So make sure you're calibrating that uh, in, in setting your targets correctly. Um, you get this information off from the seed tag. Um, this is an example for, of Jupiter white wheat seed. Seed count was 9,993 um, on this particular one. So in here, you would be right at this level. So if your target was 1.6, you'd put 160 pounds of seed on uh, per acre. Calibration is important. It doesn't matter what kind of planter you have. Um, make sure you're getting uh, it calibrated. Look in your operator's manual um, to uh, know how to calibrate properly. Um, there's quite a few growers that have the um, uh, onboard scales uh, now that uh, on the seed bin, so that that way you know uh, how much, how many pounds of seed are in it. Plan out an acre and keep track of what your seat, what your pounds were in it before, and how many pounds after, and then that's a really good way of calibrating and knowing for sure uh, how many seeds per pound you are, or how many seeds uh, per acre you're you're planting. Um, but make sure you calibrate, um, and you have to do this for every variety that you're planting on your farm. Planting depth: How deep do we want to go? Um, well, the, the deeper you plant, as you can imagine, um, uh, the scale on the left here is, is planting depth from half inch down to two and a half inch depth. Um, and these numbers here, these GDDs, are the number of GDDs that it will take to accumulate to get it emerged. Um, so the deeper you plant, the more heat units it'll take. If you plant really shallow, um, it doesn't take very many heat units compared to planting down here at uh, two inches deep. Um, it takes a lot more heat units uh, to uh, for it to emerge. Um, the other important thing to note on here is your crown roots. Um, uh, wheat has crown roots just like corn does, and you want those crown roots to be about a half an inch below the soil surface. If you're planting your seed at a half inch um, uh, below the soil surface, you're not going to get your crown roots um, quite where you want to be. 
Um, you want to make sure that you got that seed deep enough. Um, so I recommend in that inch and a quarter to inch and a half would probably be about your target um, seeding depth uh, for wheat. If it's really, really dry soil conditions, you can plant deeper and go into it. We've planted as deep as three and a half inches and in the wheat will emerge. Your emergence decreases because it's dry and plus um, the coleoptile has to push up so far. Um, but uh, yeah, for most cases, if you've got adequate soil moisture, inch to in, or inch to quarter to inch and a half is the, is the target depth. Um, and this is just a, a picture showing different planting depths. You can see the seed down here. Um, uh, and that, so that would be the seed depth. Then your soil line would be this area where the, it transitions from the yellow to the green. Um, so the deeper the, it was planted, notice what the, how much tillering this, this plant has uh, compared to these other more shallow. Um, and this one actually was, that seed is right here, which is almost on the surface. You know, your, your best plants look like these two here where you're, you're planted more at your target depth. Uniform emergence is also important. Um, notice in this picture here, there's some skips here, uh, right here around that five and a half inch mark. There's uh, two or three plants there. And then you got from seven inches all the way to what, about 11 and a half, there's nothing in there. Um, that's not a good stand. You wanna have a, a good uniform stand. You want something that looks a little more like this. Um, so make sure you, you set your, uh, planter up uh, for uniform planting um, and, and uniform emergence. Seed bed preparation is important. Um, if you have high residue like this and you're trying to no-till, sometimes getting cut through that residue uh, is, is a challenge. Um, and here's an example. You can kind of see it in this picture down here. Here's some seed um, that, you know, what kind of soil seed contact you got there. It's, it's very poor. Um, so you want to get good soil to seed contact. Um, and you also have to deal with those kind of things. Um, I don't know what fall is going to look like this year, but hopefully we won't have, um, you know, too wet conditions and, and have to deal with this. Um, in terms of fertilizer in the fall, um, you want your soil pH should be between six and seven. If you're low, uh, lime to a target pH of 6.5. Um, you can put on 20 to 30 pounds. So I wouldn't recommend going any more than that of nitrogen in the fall. Um, we often don't see a response to nitrogen in the fall. It's variable from year to year, um, unless your soil nitrate test level is below 10 ppm. So if there's just um, a low level of nitrate in the soil, um, then you would see a response to that 20 to 30 pounds of N. Um, otherwise, when you're higher than that, um, we're not seeing a whole lot of response. In terms of phosphorus and potassium, um, you want to keep it in the maintenance zone, um, your soil test levels, and then apply crop removal rates. Um, we have the, remember the, the new tri-state fertilizer recommendations now use Malik 3. Um, and so the critical levels for phosphorus are 30 and 50. That's your maintenance range. That's the target where you want to keep your soil test levels at. Um, and the critical levels for K uh, for wheat um, with a, a five or lower CEC, it's 100 to 130. Greater than six, it's 120 to 170 are your uh, critical thresholds there. So that's where you'd want to maintain your soil pH or uh, your soil test levels. So with that, I think I'll wrap up here for now and then we'll do questions uh, after a bit here then, huh? Thank you for attending this morning and I'm going to keep it short and quick. Move into the Q&A because Dennis has to jump off in three minutes here. And I see he has been writing responses to questions in the chat. So if he's already written a reply to you, please don't be offended if I go ahead and skip your question when reading them off to him. Um, Dennis, it looks like the first one you haven't addressed is row spacing, seven and a half inch versus 10 inch. Is there any difference in yield? Yeah, so um, I'm going to share my screen and put another slide up here. Um, so this is some data that shows uh, uh, or for some from some other work that we've been doing uh, on row spacing. Um, and this was using our precision planter. So we were trying to singulate seed um, and we had a seeding rate component as well. But this is the difference in the row spacing. We had five, seven and a half, 10 and 15. And these are the yields over um, the, the four years of the project. So seven and a half is kind of our industry standard at 102. Um, when we go to 10 inch row spacing, we're losing about four. Notice it's not statistically different. Um, when we widen out to 15 inch row spacing, um, it drops off to 85, which is statistically different. 
But the other way to look at this is if I go to a more narrow, um, now I've increased by 10 bushels um, or almost 10% um, higher yield potential by going narrow. So um, I, I think going from seven and a half to, to tens, I, I don't think you're gonna take that big of a hit in your yield potential, but going to 15, you definitely will. Um, and then the other question, that I had up there was, uh, in fact, that was actually, I think, direct message to me. Um, we've been doing some work on broadcast incorporating. Um, so here's some data on broadcast incorporating. Uh, well, first, this is the precision planter versus the drill versus an air seeder um, on fields. Um, and the, the precision planter in each of these years, here on in 2021, Genesee 21, Ingham in 22, Huron in 23. Um, there's 17 years worth of data here. Um, the difference between them was not significant in all the other, um, the remainder of those 17 different trials. Um, so each of these provided equal yield in most of the years. However, there's one, two, three, four years where the yields were different. And generally when the, the higher yield um, is the precision planner in each of these uh, scenarios. So with the, when you do look at broadcast incorporation, um, we found the same thing. We had three years of those 17 um, where there was um, statistical difference in, in the yields, but the remainder of those 17, absolutely no statistical difference um, with the broadcast incorporation of seed, broadcast being down here um, uh, or on the far right with this kind of dark checked pattern um, here. So, only at Huron in 23 was there a difference. Um, it, it was the drill followed by the air seeder, which was the same as the broadcast incorporation. In Jackson County, um, the uh, air seeder did do better than the broadcast incorporation. And then in Clinton in 21, it was the other way around. The broadcast incorporation did better than, than the uh, air seeder. So the, the short story is basically broadcast incorporation can be a successful method um, using a high speed disc, control your depth to two and a half to maybe three inches of tillage depth. Um, know you're getting random placement in terms of depth to your seed. Um, so that's a consideration to think about uh, as well. All right, Dennis, we had one more for you if you have time before you leave. You bet. All right. Our other one we had for you is what is the downside to planting too early in September? Yep. So I was going to start answering um, uh, the. Uh, answering that question and I didn't get, get it done. Um, we don't have a lot of good information on um, uh, planting early because uh, we typically aren't really able, if, you're, if you have a corn silage uh, situation, you might be able to plant earlier in September um, than like your fly free date. Um, we don't have a lot of good information on that. Although um, from some other states, Planting too early can cause yield reduction, actually, because when you plant too early, um, what happens is you get a lot of that lush green growth. I've seen um, as many as eight to nine tillers in the fall. Um, uh, that is a recipe for lodging um, the following year. Uh, so we, we don't have a lot of good information about that. And, and actually, Manny, and I think Manny's on here this morning, um, uh, is is actually starting a trial where we're going to have a planting date like early September um, to really kind of quantify because we've only been showing the chart that shows it's a decrease as you go later. There's there's an asymptote. Um, it, it starts low and then you, there is a peak to it and we got to find out what that is. All right, perfect. Uh, Dennis, it's the last one we had that you hadn't answered in the chat. So if you need to jump off, thank you so much for being with us this morning. You bet. Um, Jeff, we don't have anything for you, you in the chat here either right now. So whenever you choose to jump off before we move into answering what Dennis already answer, answered in the chat for people as he jumps on us, thank you for being with us this morning as well. And good luck Thanks. on your first day of classes. <laughs> Thanks. Um, um yep. I don't know if, I don't know if Manny's on, if he has anything he wants to add, um, to some of the planting and equipment trials and row spacing and population stuff that we've we've done. Yeah, I'm I'm here trying to take care of uh, kids. Uh, woke up early today. <laughs> oh. uh, 
Yeah, I think you pretty much covered it at all. I think this idea how early is too early, I think we still don't know the answer to that, right? So there is some data from Ohio that shows uh, a yield decline that, that you are referring to, Dennis. So again, that's coming from Ohio. And uh, this year we are planning to actually plant uh, tomorrow if, if we can. So we are starting September 1st and uh, then planting on a weekly basis. To, to really figure out, you know, is is there such a thing as planting too early, which I believe, again, is connected to that uh, uh, extra tailoring, right? And it probably even uh, leaves plant more prone to uh, winter uh, injury and uh, then uh, lodging poten uh, higher lodging potential later in the, in, in the year. So uh, the planting method, you know, again, you covered some, some of it. Uh, we have a lot of data. So, uh, again, I think uh, I'll work with Dennis probably putting an article out uh, so you all can, can see some of the, the data. We just wrapped up uh, on looking at the data here. But, again, if you're trying to improve your yield potential, going to a narrow row spacing, I believe, is the way to go, right? Dennis did show some of the data that, that we have collected. And uh, going to 10-inch row spacing, uh, again, is not a winner. You might not lose too much compared to seven and a half, but what I have seen in our research is going to a narrow row spacing. We were using a pre-season uh, planting system. I'm not sure if a drill would do that as well. That question is still out there, but yeah, going to a narrow row spacing, timely planting and not pushing too high of uh, our seeding rate, I believe is where we, we want to be if we want to attain high yield potentials. Yep. I, I think this could be maybe a topic of a virtual breakfast for the future. Yep. Perfect. Um, Dennis, if you are you jumping off now or did you want to read your own replies? Oh, did, did I have more in, in the chat? Sorry. No, oh, no, you no, you already replied to them all by okay. by it. So I was just checking. No, I do need to get going if that's okay, okay. with everybody. Um, feel free to send me an email at um, penin34 at msu.edu, um, and uh, I'll, I'll get back with you with any questions or or anything like that. So, yep, Perfect. feel free to reach out. Thanks, Dennis. All right. So do we have any other specialists who would like to give an update today? All Chris, right. Any Chris here. I'll say something because Thank I you. always do. Sorry, I was working on a syllabus for the class. <laughs> um I think there's some Western bean cutworm out there. I don't, I, I've found it in in random fields. So this is the time if you're walking to check, you know, if those uh, silks are cut off and then that that uh, that tip is opened, especially if birds are starting to work on it, that may make you kind of suspicious. So um, remember that Western bean is not controlled by any of the BTs except VIP. Um, the other thing, not related to crops so much, but those ground nesting yellow jackets are out there right now. And they're, you know, those, those ground nests are big and they're like a big hole and, uh, you know, you can be mowing or something like that. And uh, I've had neighbors getting stung and then I go over and take care of their nest, but I'm just <laughs> warning people about that. And the other thing is uh, recertification will be coming up in December for some people, and you probably don't want to take the exam. So putting your credits in in this breakfast, especially we have a few more and some of those uh, some of those meetings in the fall, and then you can recertify easily because that's what I did using the breakfast. And I really appreciate that. So <laughs> yeah, that's all reminders. Perfect. Thank you. If we have any other specialists on who want to say something, please feel free to unmute. All right, I'm going to read Dennis's responses for anybody who may be on their phone and unable to see it then for the ones he answered in the chat. Um, again, any specialists want to chime in, feel free to unmute and talk, start talking and I'll shut up. Um, we had a question on the fly free date. Um, is the fly free date, is Hessian fly an issue or a rule of thumb? And is it an outdated method, which Dennis kind of addressed in his presentation? Um, but he says the fly free date probably needs to be updated. That being said, Hessian fly is not a big pest problem in wheat anymore. The date for your county is a good agronomic date to plan on starting to plant your wheat season. Um, after that, if, which one does this go to? What is the best way to get an idea of seed per pound when you use your own seed? Dennis says, if you are saving your seed and want to determine your seeds per pound, you will need access to a gram scale. 
count 500 seeds by hand and weigh them on the gram scale, multiply the grams by 908 to get seeds per pound. For example, 500 seeds weigh 18 grams would be 15 times 908, which equals 13,620 seeds per pound. Uh, the next one was for a given variety, if TKW is low, should you increase your seeding rate? And Dennis said, if you have low TKW, you will likely experience reduced emergence. How much it will be affected will depend on the quality of the seed lot. Do a germ test, adjust for germination rate. For example, if 10% of the seeds don't germinate, you should increase your seeding rate by 10%. And that being said, that's everything that he had to answer. And one final throw out in case any of our specialists want to say anything. Hey, Jenna, it's Marty. Perfect, Marty, go ahead. Um, yes, yeah, so just really quick on saving seed. Um, that's all well and good to try and save some money. It's great. But uh, by doing that, you run the risk of running into uh, smut or bunt issues. So they are seed born. Um, and then so if you're going to plant your own seed, ideally, you would also have it uh, possibly cleaned, but also professionally treated because the dry box uh, planter box treatments do not do a very good job of getting coverage on all of those seeds. And so that's where we're running into issues. Um, I know there's been some organic wheat, like 16,000 bushels or something rejected because of smut um, and also some pretty heavy dockage of uh, regular wheat um, in the order of 50 cents up to about $3 a bushel because of smut and bump issues and just, again, rejections from some elevators. So just don't forget about that uh, in the scheme of things. Great reminder, Marty. Thank you. Um, we have another question that I cannot answer, and I don't know if anybody has experience with this. Um, has anybody found a good app for counting seed? If anybody has, let us know. We can share We can share that next week on virtual breakfast then. Um, and we can also ask Dennis if he has an answer to that one as well. So thank you guys all for participating with us this morning for virtual breakfast. If you have any questions that weren't answered either from Jeff or Dennis because they jumped off before you were able to get them in, please feel free to shoot either them direct emails or shoot them to us and we can get them directed to them and get you an answer. So thank you for participating with us this morning for virtual breakfast and we look forward to seeing you next week.